Hello and welcome. You're watching NewsX and I'm Megha Sharma. History has been scripted today at the Adani Group's Wisinjam International Seaport in Thiruvananthapuram. The port today received its first mothership. The port that is slated for full commissioning by September this year has welcomed vessel San Fernando, a China-flagged vessel. Now, the seaport being developed in public-private partnership by the Kerala government, the central government and the Adani Ports Company will ultimately be able to handle over 5 million TEUs and offer an alternative to nearby container transshipment ports such as Singapore and Colombo. The port has the distinction of being India's first semi-automated container transshipment port and largest deep water port. The San Fernando is operated by Maersk. It arrived at the port today with a full container load of cargo. It has a capacity of 8,000 to 9,000 TUs and is expected to be followed by even larger vessels. The government and Adani ports in special processing zone have spent 8,800 crores so far, of which Adani share is 3,600 crores in the first phase. Another 20,000 crore rupees over the remaining three phases is going to be spent for its construction. The total envisage length is 2 kilometers, of which 800 meters will be implemented in the first phase and the remaining 1.2 kilometers in subsequent phases. By the end of 2028, the port will be able to handle 3 million TEUs. The capacity can be expanded further to over 5 million TEUs. The port already has 600 meters of operational length and 7,500 container yard slots are being prepared to accept cargo vessels. The turnaround time at the port is expected to be around 24 hours and the port is also in close proximity to the international shipping route at around 100 nautical miles. Let's start off this conversation. We have put out those stats for you and this big achievement that has been made by India. And I'm going to start my conversation with Commodore Anil Jai Singh. And Commodore, uh, a massive achievement uh, in terms of the magnitude of this port, the first phase that has been completed, and the inaugural reception of the first cargo vessel that has arrived at the port. What all are the future uh, uh, achievements that we are expecting uh, at this Adani port? Uh, well, I think it's a milestone achievement, definitely, in H India's uh, port history and port development. It points a very promising picture towards the future. You must not, you know, India did, in one of the things India was lacking was a good deep water port for transshipment. And one of the success stories of the Colombo port and the Singapore port was the extent of Indian trade that was transshipped from these ports. The extent of it, Colombo, almost 45% of the trade passing through Colombo was transshipment for India. So I think it was high time and long overdue that India had a transshipment port of its own. Vizinjum is the first one. I think there are two or three more in the pipeline, including the Great Nicobar Island. Which will, be, which will help a lot because don't forget, India is at the moment on the threshold of a 5 trillion economy and which is going to, if it's going to be 12 trillion or 10 trillion by 2030, there will be an exponential increase in the amount of trade that the country will do with the rest of the world. Already 90% of our trade by volume and more than 70% by value travels over the sea. 80% of our energy comes from the sea. So we are very dependent on the sea and the safe movement and quick and efficient movement of our trade for the well-being of our economy. And for that, this port is extremely important. Uh, there's been a lot of politics associated with this port. I think we won't get into that. Even now, there's a political slugfest going on as to who takes credit. But the right. fact of the matter is that for India, this is a very positive development. And we have to focus a lot of attention in the future on our complete maritime infrastructure, ports being one of the very important features. Hmm. Maritime capital and maritime development is a long-term capital process. It's not something that happens overnight. So if we have to prepare for a decade from now, we have to start put the building blocks in place now. And I think the Sagarmala program, which was initiated in 2015, is, has identified some very specific milestones, which are constantly monitored, in which port-led development is, very, is a very important feature. Port-led development, green port-led development, not only just port-led development. Okay. So this being a semi-automated port will definitely be make it more efficient, more flexible and more nimble in terms of handling trade. Okay. I know it's just, okay. it's just the beginning. Yeah. They can only handle 2,000 containers, 1,900 containers were unloaded out of 9,000 containers which were meant for Indian ports. But this is just the beginning. So, it points to a very promising future. Captain Sanjay Karve, uh, is it ironical that uh, a country that is surrounded by the seas on all three sides still has been at a very nascent stage when it comes to building these deep sea ports 
all around? Mega, not really. But uh, before we get into this, I would just like to inform the viewers. We hear this word T E U. What exactly is this T E U? You know, you'll find the newspapers and channels talking of twenty thousand T E U's, thirty thousand T E U's. It is nothing but a twenty feet equivalent unit. That is the size of a standard container which a merchant vessel or a merchant ship carries. Like today, the ship has docked with twenty thousand containers. So it is. 20000 teu trade what is creditable is 18000 are being offloaded in 24 hours coming back to your question 50 years or 70 years of independence if you look back first 30 to 40 years we have spent trying to get our economy in shape any time anything to do with ports it requires huge amount of influx of funds getting funds in those years was not very easy the foreign nations or the foreign institutes were also not very comfortable lending india so much of funds indian agencies were not comfortable pumping up so much of money with growth of economy and the overall growth people have realized like commodore singh just pointed out most of our trade is through sea lanes and it is essential that the sea lanes must reach indian ports so it is only in the last 5 to 7 years that people have realized that to increase trade which has a positive economic impact you need to have a chain of deep sea water ports you have vadavan port coming in yeah the vadavan port is going to be the one of the top 10 ports in asia we have we don't have a top 10 port in our country imagine like you said a country with a huge coastline doesn't have a port in the top 10 but the vadavan port which will come in another 3 years time that will fit into that so now we have vadavan ijinagram and the great nicobar island port coming in we require more of these ports on eastern coast also and the west coast also okay. this will speed up economy generate employment and more than that what will happen is this ports coming in will spur satellite cities you know you cannot have people commuting every day from mumbai to vadavan which is near palgar about 100 kilometers So you'll have a satellite city growing up there, correct? Which would be a good sign for the economy, employment, and the general upliftment of the country's economic status. Hmm. Okay, Professor Nalapath, uh, how uh, integral does political will uh, weigh in when uh, infrastructure and ports of such uh, huge magnitudes are being set up in the country? well you just heard uh, you know the, the the naval experts views that over the last 5 to 7 years and i fully agree the fact of the matter is that india could have had the possibility of having for example a very huge merchant fleet you had the great eastern company you had sindia steam navigation you had even some other companies and you know they were all doing very very good work you had the shipping corporation of india SCI, which is state-owned, and they were all, you know, doing very well. And all of a sudden, somehow, the they shrunk, and mainly because of complete negligence by the governments of the day. So this has been revived under Prime Minister Modi, and this no is absolutely no surprise. Therefore, that now the fruits of Modi 1.0 and 2.0 are becoming more and more evident during Modi 3.0. so that, that is definitely a very welcome a uh, move and at the same time i am very certain given the high standards that the prime minister expects uh, from uh, every project that you know adani is is very familiar with ports where mundra for example and in mundra also we have a satellite town as you mentioned and that came up a, a long while ago so he knows how to deal with ports and i'm very certain he will look after the security aspect as well in a very comprehensive and capable way yeah. because now for example vessels coming from xiamen from china one has to pay some attention to them in terms of you know any problem but i'm very confident that adani ports have got the equipment they have the technical manpower then they have the skill to ensure that indian security is fully protected while these vast tonnages are being offloaded and may mega may point out shipping got a boom with container traffic boom and that was many decades ago 
containers came into use many decades ago. And yet for the, all those decades, there was no real deep water port in India until the new government came in 2014 and said, what's this? Why can't we change this? So I personally feel it's a story of neglect. It's a story of missed opportunities. And I'm glad that that's no longer a story in India. Okay. Commander Anil Singh had also mentioned uh, about uh, how uh, this is going to, you know, further burgeon the economy of the country. And uh, Mitali, uh, if you could shed more light into uh, us wanting to reach the level of $10 trillion economy. We, we can't just sustain ourselves on the IT sector. Uh, besides having infrastructure in place, besides having our education and health and jobs that are to be provided, uh, how integral does it become for our trade to happen and how helpful it becomes in reducing the costs by way of maritime trade? Absolutely, absolutely, Megha. So, you know, in economics, we have a one-to-one -one relationship between the growth in logistics and freight traffic and the growth of the GDP. And the relationship in India stands thus. For every 1.2% increase in, you know, the traffic, logistics traffic, there's a 1% increase in GDP. So, you know, when, you're, when your growth in trade happens, your GDP growth happens. So there's a direct relationship. What I want to highlight today is that there are four, five sub-sectors of the maritime India vision that have been prioritized by this government over the last 10 years, which are today bearing fruit in the way that we are seeing the investments that we are seeing. The first is, you know, Maritime India Vision 2030 lays out these areas very clearly. The first is shipbuilding. You know, this is one area in which India was lagging for many decades. And with the prioritization now given to the shipbuilding industry and to indigenize shipbuilding, it helps us because even if our ports are not immediately deep water ports, by producing indigenous shipping, and ships within the country, manufacturing the ships within the country, it helps us create navigable vessels which can, you know, navigate the coastline of the country. The second is the integration of coastal shipping with inland waterways. See, we have a very large navigable coastal shipping route, which is there, say, from Vizag to Chennai, Vizag to Kolkata. But also, we need to link these, you know, coastal routes with the inland waterway routes, you know, there are inland waterways in yeah. UP, there are inland waterways in Assam, all over the Northeast. So when we link these routes, it creates a whole new logistics facility. And the third, which is very important for the maritime vision, which is what we have seen today, is the creation of transshipment ports. Now, why is transshipment so important is because this helps us become a center globally for cargo to come get aggregated, disaggregated, create new supply chains, and then send cargo out to different countries. So it's not only about trading with India, but trading through India, Absolutely. which can help us, you know, generate more revenues. So all these three coming together has created the conducive environment that we are seeing today. Absolutely. Commander Raj, Anil Jai Singh, there's another aspect to it, which is, which is, uh, 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 very important uh, and cannot be left behind, which is strategic aspect of uh, having ports and uh, naval bases across the length and breadth of the country. Uh, and uh, how, st how important does it become to not just have a port which is commercially viable, but also uh, uh, marks India uh, on the global map, but, but at the time of... Uh, uh, you know, uh, maritime wars that are being played. You have China, you have America, which are amongst the two top uh, naval uh, forces across the globe. It is also it is also India that is also vying for it. How does how does that help in in having a holistic um, maritime port structure in the country and in the country, yeah. not just in the country, but then you're looking at other exploring at other places where uh, uh, these uh, uh, ports and bases can be built? Well, you see, maritime power. Firstly, we have to differentiate between maritime power and naval power. Now, India is a formidable naval power. 
but we have still got a long way to go to be a maritime power because that is the aggregation of a complete maritime capability of a nation with an all of government approach. Now, in that, we are definitely lagging behind. And I think this port-led development plan, Sagar Mala, under which all these activities are happening, which Mithali also mentioned about the clusters, about inland waterways, are all about strengthening that maritime power of India, where we're looking at a comprehensive approach towards enhancing our maritime capability, our maritime capacity. Now, so far, we were dependent on foreign ports for transshipment. Now, transshipment is very important. It, can, it is critical to our, to our trade and to our economy. So it's very important that we have sovereign capability in, in at least transshipping our cargo. Forget about you know, yeah. sending it to other ports. That, of course, is very important. It will it, it, earn you precious foreign exchange. It will bring you onto the main global waterways of the world. India is located at a, India's biggest advantage is this maritime geography. We okay. straddle some of the most critical sea lanes in the world. The most important sea lane uh, connecting the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean passes just south of India. Uh, China has always spoken of its Malacca dilemma as a, as a real and pre present danger, where, it's, where it is scared that India can choke its strait passing through the Malacca Straits. So India has to be very powerful and very strong from a maritime perspective in its southern peninsula uh, construct. And I think that is why along with these ports, we are also talking of enhancing maritime security. That will not only be the function of the Navy, it will be the function of the Coast Guard. There are now the ISPS codes in, uh, in place which ports have to uh, sort of adhere to, mm. which bring in perimeter security, waterfront security, cargo security, all cargo coming in is monitored. So all these factors have to be, when all these factors are taken into consideration, the strategic importance of these ports becomes all the more important. It removes a major vulnerability or mitigates a major vulnerability that India had so far of not being, of being dependent on foreign ports for its transshipment. For example, let's say Colombo. Now we know the Chinese are making major inroads into Colombo. Now if Colombo port were at some point of time to come under some sort of Chinese control, or not even if Chinese control, but a Chinese naval presence, it could choke our transshipment, our trade being transshipped from there. Singapore, much of our trade comes from Singapore, which is through the Malacca Straits. So if we could choke Chinese trade going through the Malacca Straits, they could very well choke the, tra tra the traffic coming to us through the Malacca Straits from Singapore. So the yeah. sovereign capability greatly enhances our strategic, you know, our strategic uh, sort of independence in being able to address the complete multitude of maritime threats that face the Indian Ocean. We know the great power contestation in future between China and the US is going to take place in the Indian Ocean. The Indo-Pacific, yes, in Taiwan, yes, there will be a skirmish, whatever might happen. But the real contestation is going to happen here because it is only the Indian Ocean which gives China the sea space to, to exercise its maritime capability. And it gives China access to the Atlantic, which is very, very important if it has to become a global maritime power. If it doesn't have access to the Atlantic, it is limited to its little geographical, you know, first island chain, second island chain around Taiwan, which is of no use. It's okay. It will dominate yeah. the South China Sea. It will be belligerent. It will trouble its neighbors. But it doesn't become a maritime power, which is its ultimate aim. So from that perspective, I think the creation of such capability, the Maritime Vision 2030 takes into account all this. And, and naval development and naval security will be is complementary towards the development of all these capabilities. The more maritime capability you have, the better will be your, your naval uh, presence, the better will be your capability. You will have to develop the capacity and capability to protect these maritime assets, which will help your naval forces to uh, be able to do that and establish a more preeminent position in the Indian Ocean than it has now. Okay. The Indian Navy has never been challenged in the Indian Ocean, really speaking, if you see. There's no other Navy even close to us in size or scope. But the PLA Navy is definitely a future threat. So we have to make sure that we have the adequate capacities to ensure that we always retain the maritime edge in the Indian Ocean. Okay. All right. Uh, Professor Nalapath, when, uh, when India decides to build ports and buy out uh, uh, naval lands, whether it is in, in, uh, whether it is in Sri Lanka, uh, to match uh, the kind of threat that China at this point of time holds, uh, when we take a look at uh, uh, with the battle that was fought in terms of getting hold of the Haifa port and uh, the kind of revelations that are coming in that there was an entire strategy uh, that was uh, orchestrated by China to come up with a with vendetta which brought in the stocks of Adani group of companies plummeting down uh, that allowed for some sh the, sh the short selling of the stocks happen but uh, the entirety of it, it was the handiwork of the Chinese Communist Party. So, so you know, you understand, uh, uh, you know, the importance 
and and uh, the sensitivity with which uh, these matters need to be handled and and more importantly uh, like i said how important and integral does it become for an economy for a country to have hold of these ports not just within the country but across the across the board across the subcontinent or across the globe it is and here you see that a company such as the adani ports is taking on the mantle and has the wherewithal to uh, not just buy these ports within the country build them invest in them but also in the subcontinent and 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 there you have it in israel in the middle east as well well you're quite right about that because the reality is uh, what is important to india is not simply southeast asia but west asia as well and yes dubai for example is a major uh, center where indian trade is concerned and uh, if we had our own facility that would not be the case singapore is on the other side there's no reason why we can't have uh, a port city in india that uh, essentially rivals uh, both dubai and singapore in the maritime domain it is very feasible and I, one thing i is very clear make a uh, prime minister modi understands that we are in an era of world war 2.0 and in the era of world war 2.0 the main adversary is china is no longer russia the main theater is asia the indo pacific is not the atlantic it's not europe he understands that very well which is why he has taken a very wise policy regarding ukraine not getting in india involved in that mess now south korea for whatever reason they were forced to take a line favoring the us and the european powers and you're seeing what's happening in north korea the russians and covertly the chinese and various other groups are ensuring that north korea will very soon pose a significant security challenge to the united states through its nuclear and missile program so we have yeah. you know the consequences of a smart geopolitical uh, policy are very clear and the consequences of following an outdated policy the dangers of that are also very clear uh, this government has got the like, idea of the consequences very clearly and that is why it's paying so much attention to it. look at ship building mega i mean we had this vishakhapatnam port and that is it what happened for a long time it did not really uh, uh, manage to to ramp up its uh, facilities mm. we need much more ship building as has correctly been pointed out by naval experts and may I point with one last point inland waterways the cheapest transport system available in the world correct the cheapest you travel by inland waterway you take huge cargoes by inland waterway it's much cheaper than rail it's much cheaper than by ship and therefore the uh, development of inland waterways which again has been made a priority by this government is very important for the future growth of india because we can't compete unless our costs are low and we cost cost can't be low if logistical costs are high so that is the point that is ha happening now and i'm very glad it's finally beginning to happen okay all right uh, uh, coming back to you captain sanjay karve so what's uh, what's the road ahead so do we look at the large term plan is is it is it a long term plan whether we you know we take 10 years or 20 years uh, to have our ports developed have our maritime uh, capabilities up to mark by, uh, along uh, along the lines of uh, uh, dubai or along the lines of singapore along the lines of south america uh, how does this entire plan then come into reality meda if you look at any maritime project it's not an overtime overnight project it takes years if not decade so what india has embarked for last about 8 to 10 years to actually see the results on ground we will take another 10 to 15 years in addition to that what we need to cater is the last mile connectivity we are going strong on building up ports container ports small ports practically every 200 kilometers the government is trying to get a port but having offloaded the goods on those ports are our roads good enough to transfer them to where they are intended to go unfortunately the answer is not very encouraging we still do not have an excellent network of roads because once you offload these goods on the ports what happens next that is the question which every planner or the government needs to address seriously you look at the konkan coast or the west coast it is only south of mangalore or south of karwar that you have a good road network running parallel to the coast 
you move north of karwat right up to vadavanpur you really don't have a good road network so whatever you are saving you are losing out there maritime ports or huge ports is a necessity which everyone is aware of and people are working on it and no one is expecting a miracle no one is expecting that tomorrow this is going to reap benefits it will take 10 years maybe 15 years the planners have done very well in their planning if you look at the blueprint of the vadavan port like the commodore pointed out there is a separate jetty which has been earmarked for coast guard i think probably first time in indian history a merchant port or a container port is being built with a separate earmarked place for the coast guard or the navy that means they are trying to integrate maritime security and the naval security or the maritime growth with naval growth okay all these projects are highly capital intensive you require money and you require big companies with adanis tatas reliance these are the people who have to step in with governmental support even vadavan port if you see it is the government of india along with maharashtra maritime board which are pulling in money right. you require the government to step in to some extent to help these companies to move on ahead yeah absolutely and therefore therefore that that's exactly why political will is of uh, most importance i'm out of time i thank all of you for joining me on the telecast and enlightening us on this very important subject i'll take a quick short break thanks for watching